thank you for joining with us today in worship. We pray that you are staying safe and healthy during this period of social distancing. Hopefully this will be over soon and we'll be able to again gather together in worship to our Lord. Today we will have the opportunity to join our hearts together in singing praise to the Lord while teaching and admonishing one another through the songs that we're going to sing. We will provide you an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper during our program today. Just have your communion supplies ready at the time and we will commune together. Our lesson today is going to come out of the book of Hebrews chapter 10 if you'd like to prepare ahead of time for that. So please join with us today as we worship and study together. Let's bow together as we begin with prayer. Our loving and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this another Lord's Day, for an opportunity that we have to sing praises to you, to study your word, to worship together even though we cannot be together, we can worship together in spirit and in truth. Bless our time together today, bless our, our singing, our worship, our study, that uh, we will be in accord with your will in everything and help us to soon be able to gather together again in one place that we can worship you in spirit and in truth together. Thank you most of all for the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name, amen. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Ears I spin in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. 
There my bird and soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my bird and soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my bird and soul found liberty at Calvary. Uh, now we'll have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we'll begin by reading Mark chapter 14 and verse 22. Here it says, And as they were eating the Passover meal, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And of course, as we use this bread, we use an unleavened type of bread. And you might wonder, why do we use unleavened bread? Bread without yeast. Of course, there's, there's two reasons. First is that when the first Passover, when Israel left Egypt in haste, they didn't have time uh, to add yeast to that bread. And so it, it represents that. But secondly, it represents the sinless body of Jesus. Leaven or yeast contains a fungus which was used to enhance bread, causing it to rise when baked. But Jesus was sinless, and this unleavened bread represents his sinless body in the Lord's Supper. So with these things in mind, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord, our God, our Creator, Lord, we're so grateful for you and for each and every blessing that you give to us. And Father, especially grateful now as we reflect on the sinless body of Jesus that was broken for us. Father, we're grateful for his sacrifice. And Lord, we know that we can never fully express what it means to us and, and how important it is that, we, uh, that, that, that this happened for our salvation. Father, pray that as we partake of this now that uh, we might think about Jesus' body on that cross and how he lived a perfect life so that we would be able to be saved from sin. Father, be with each one partaking now. Pray that we would all do it in a manner that is pleasing unto you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in observing the Lord's Supper, we continue to read from the 14th chapter of Mark in verses 23 through 25, where in that Passover meal, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Again, you may ask, why do we use grape juice in the Lord's Supper? There are two reasons. First, it's because the fruit of the grape, as was used in, in Jesus' day as a common wine, drinking wine, was available on the table at that time. But secondly, and I think more importantly, is that because of the uh, color uh, of the grape juice. It so closely resembles the color of the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross. So as we partake of the, the fruit of the vine today, help us to remember, may we remember, the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross. Let's pray together. Our loving and our gracious Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you saw fit to send Jesus to this world to die on the cross, to suffer cruelly, and that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So Father, today, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember the sacrifice Jesus made and, and may our minds focus upon that blood that came from the cross that was shed there, that we might receive remission and forgiveness of our sins. Thank you most of all for the blessings that we have through Christ. We pray in his name, amen.
He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom. By water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, <clears throat> chapter 10. <clears throat> We're going to take our lesson today from verses 19 through 25. And you're probably going to recognize that this is going to be a familiar passage of Scripture. The title that I have chosen to place on this lesson today is this, Not Forsaking. Read with me, beginning in verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his death, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The book of Hebrews was written to the first century Jewish Christians who were struggling to hold on to their faith in Jesus Christ. They were living in a world of chaos and, and cultural pressures to return to a more comfortable past. Many Jewish Christians were trying to escape the persecution by the pagan world and also the persecution that they were receiving from their Jewish brethren because they were Christians. Consequently, many Jewish Christians were defecting back to Judaism rather than press on as a Christian. In short, the writer of Hebrews is impressing upon those Christians in that day that what they have gained in Christ far outweighs what they were giving up in Judaism. Today, 
We are living in a world that is attacking everything that we believe. Our faith is being tested like never in our lifetime. Be sure that Satan knows how to make the most of this pandemic. And no doubt, he is jumping with joy each Lord's Day that we're not assembling together as a church. So today, I, I want to think seriously about the meaning of this term, not forsaking, that sometimes uh, misguides us in different ways. And so let's think about that as it's written there in Hebrews 10, verse 25. First, we need to defend that word. What is forsaking? According to Mr. Webster, forsake means to oppose, refuse, contend, strive, to give up or to renounce, to leave or to desert. An example would be a man who, who actually leaves or deserts his wife and his children uh, for absolutely no legitimate reason. Or a soldier leaving his post without obtaining permission just because he wanted to leave. It's called a wall. Uh, people forsake responsibilities every day. They, respons re uh, they forsake the responsibilities to their job. They forsake the responsibilities to paying their bills and a lot of other ways where people are forsaking responsibilities in our world today. Biblically, the word forsake comes from the Greek in kataleipo, which means to abandon, leave behind, or to neglect the things Christians are to be doing. It's the very word that Jesus used when he was on the cross, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Jesus felt that emptiness at that moment as God turned his back on sin. And it's the meaning of the prophecy that Peter quoted from in Psalm 16 and verse 10 when he quoted it in Acts 2 and verse 27. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. That was a prophecy about how when Jesus died, he would not be left in the world of the dead, but God would raise him to life again. So we ask first, how did Hebrews 10, 25 apply to the first century church? What did not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together mean to them? Well, first of all, let's consider the situation of the church in the first century. They were in a world where Christianity was rejected for the most part. They were in a world where the first day of the week was a day of work, not a day of worship. They had came together to worship anyway, and it was very difficult for them to do that. They were in a world where many personal sacrifices had to be made in order to be faithful to the Lord. It was hard to be a faithful Christian in the first century. And there needed to be the admonishment and the edification to, to them to remain faithful under those circumstances of hardship. Now note some other references that come out of the book of Hebrews that are in this same vein of thinking. In chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the writer there says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. The rebellion was the wilderness wandering where they rebelled against God and stayed out there for some 40 years. Chapter 4 and verse 7, again, he designates a certain day saying, In David, today, after such a long time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You see, even in David's day, many centuries later, after the wandering in the wilderness, uh, the admonitions to be faithful were necessary, and so it was in New Testament times. So notice some of the admonitions that come out of those verses that we just referred to. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Or exhort one another daily or hold the beginning of our confidence to the end, or do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Verse, chapter 4 and verse 11 says this, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. These admonitions were given because these Christians were on the verge of falling away from Christ. These were real Christians with real temptations to fall away. In fact, 
Many of them did. For example, Demas, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Diotrephes. It shows the danger of God's people, toward God's people, of what, what happens when they begin to let the trials, uh, the, the tribulations, the troubles of life pull them away from God, from Christ, and from his church. You see, these Old Testament examples serve to help us to understand what God wants us to know and do today. Romans 15 and verse 4 says this, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through faith and patience of the Scriptures might have hope. So those examples are examples for us today. So that brings us to ask this question. How does Hebrews 10, 25 apply to the church today? Well, let's begin by saying what it doesn't mean. Because I think sometimes we confuse the lines where they might be. It doesn't mean one is forsaking when they are sick. God understands that. Secondly, it doesn't mean that one is forsaking when they are caring for another person who needs their care, particularly a close family member. Thirdly, it doesn't apply to those who are in the hospital, the nursing homes, or other facilities where people are confined for care or treatment. And fourthly, it doesn't mean one is forsaken when they are required to stay home due to circumstances beyond their control, such as is the case that we're under today with the coronavirus and the social distancing that we're required to do. Such has been true many times throughout history, such as times of war, natural disasters like floods and hurricanes and tornadoes. Even then, when those things were over, people gladly came back together to worship. And we can do the same thing, and I hope that we will. And something I do want to influence or include right here is this. Please don't use the phrase providentially hindered. Providential means it comes from God. God is not going to hinder us. Circumstances in life often do. Now, what does this mean to us today in the church? Let's go back to our text in Hebrews 10, and let's look at again those verses 19 through 25, beginning with verses 19 through 21. He says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now, we'll stop right there for just a minute. This reminds us who we are. He calls them brethren. We are brethren. We are in Christ. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. And then he says, by that which enters us into the presence of God. The veil that existed in the tabernacle and the temple no longer exists. There's no longer that barrier between God's people and his throne. Jesus took it away. That leads us to the therefore, which follows in verses 22 through 24. He says in verse 22, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now let's think about that for just a moment. And let's look at it this way, that what we can call in these verses 22 through 24, let us exhortations. In verse 24, let us draw near. That's the first thing that he says. Draw near to what? To God. How do we do that? Well, first, and it's in the verse, with a true heart, a sincere heart. God knows the difference in sincerity and hypocrisy. He knows when we are sincere in what we do. Secondly, with full assurance of faith. That is a trusting and confident faith in God that he will do what he says he will do, and he's going to take care of us through all of this trouble that we're facing right now. Thirdly, have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. This has to do with repentance. Repentance starts in the heart, the mental heart, the inner person, and then it flows to the outside of the person uh, in his daily activities of life. And then fourth, having our bodies washed with pure water. It's the cleansing of the soul, not the washing of the filth of the flesh. Pure water refers to our baptism into Jesus Christ where cleansing takes place by the blood of God's perfect lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. 
That means hold fa faithfully to the confession that we made before we became a Christian. That is, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hold on to that. Don't let it go. That was a problem with these Christians in the first century that they were tempted to do. There's always that temptation to deny Christ and to turn away. Remember what happened to Peter. Uh, and, and he came back uh, in penitence. It can't happen to you. It can't happen to me. And then in verse 24, he says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We have to encourage each other in good works. Uh, it's something that we can do together. It's something that we can do when we're not together. But together especially, it is true. Promote love of the brethren. Remember what Jesus said to his apostles shortly before his crucifixion in John 13 and verse 34. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That brings us to verse 25, the verse that we're taking our main thoughts from where he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, verse 25 is the key in accomplishing the let us exhortations that we just looked at in verses 22 through 24. That's especially true in verse 24, which says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's so much easier to accomplish when we are together. You see, assembling together accomplishes many of the things that Christians are to do in building up the body of Christ. I want you to notice another passage with me in Hebrews, I mean in, in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. <clears throat> it says, And he, that's Christ, himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ." from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share for the growth of the body, for the edifying of itself in love. You're assembling together uh, as Christians accomplishes the purpose of our being together. It, it, it's what God wants us to do. It accomplishes the purpose of congregational worship. In Colossians 3 and verse 16, Paul there says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We sing together. In Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, where the disciples came together to break bread, that's in reference to the Lord's Supper, Paul, ready to depart on the morrow, preached his message until midnight. You see, we commune together. And remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And in 1 Corinthians 16 and in verse 2, Paul there wrote on the first day of the week, Let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So we give of our earnings together and put it together so we can do good works in, in continuing to teach the word of God and spreading the message throughout the world. And then in Acts 2 and verse 42, that very first church, first converse to Christ, says this of them, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. <clears throat> we study together. We enjoy fellowship together. And we pray together. And while we can do that in some ways when we're not actually in each other's presence, it's certainly much better and much easier and more is accomplished when we are together. You see, while we're doing the best to keep in communication with the congregation and to provide a time of worship by this social media that we're doing right now, this is not the way God intends for his church to function. It never was from the very beginning. We need to be together. We need to understand the meaning of not forsaking, as is used in Hebrews 10, 25. And we need to remember the words that follow 
in Hebrews 10 and in verse 26, where there the writer says, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Forsaking the assembly of ourselves together is a sin unless there is a justifiable reason why we can't. Many were guilty of this long before the stay-at-home order was given. How many will now see the need to repent and return to faithfulness and worship and study together? How many will, will see that, that need? Some might even feel justified in staying home long after the, the uh, order is lifted, uh, after this time of crisis is over. Don't make that mistake, please. Do not make that mistake. Do you want to stand before God and try to explain to him why you were forsaking the assembling of yourself with the church when you had no real reason to do so? Let's all pray that this situation will soon end. And once again, we can come together as a unified body of Christ so that we can fellowship together, we can sing together, we can commune together, we can pray together, we can study God's word together. I can hardly wait for the time that we can once again gather together in worship to our God. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, we thank you that, that you bless us in the way that you do. And we know that you are the ruler of the world, the ruler of the universe. You know what is going through the world at this time. And you know what the end result will be. Help us to be faithful through this. And when it's over, that we'll be more faithful than ever as we can once again come together, worship together, enjoy one another's fellowship together, remember Christ together, do all the things that, that we can't do right now because we're not together. And we look forward to that day. Bless us, keep us in your care, and forgive us of our sins. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching this program and joining with us in worship to our Lord. Uh, we will also be presenting a Sunday evening program as well as a Wednesday Bible study. Uh, we invite you to join us on any of these programs by way of YouTube or our uh, uh, Facebook account. You can see us there uh, each Sunday or at other times as well when they are available. We invite you to worship with us when we come back together again. Our building is located at the corner of West Woodward Avenue and Ashland Street. If you would like more information on our congregation or Churches of Christ, then, uh, or to enroll in a free Bible correspondence course, no charge to you. We'll take care of everything. Just send, a, send the information to us at 2300 West Woodward Avenue, Ruston, Louisiana, 71270. Thank you so much, and may God bless you this week. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there'll be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious
greatest day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. songs for the kids and seeing as it is spring outside we're going to start with uh, the caterpillar song fuzzy caterpillar wiggling in a tree he wiggled short he wiggled long he wiggled right at me i put him in a box don't go away i said but when i opened up the box the butterfly instead i could never make one not even if i tried only god in heaven could make a butterfly Squirmy little tadpole swimming in a lake. He wiggled right, he wiggled left, he wiggled like a snake. I put him in a jar, don't go away, I said. But when I opened up the jar, a hopping frog instead. I could never make one, not even if I tried. Only God in heaven makes frogs and butterflies. All right, last week we did our New Testament books of the Bible. Let's do our Old Testament books this week. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Sobadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Again, I look forward to being able to be back together, to be able to be uh, up front uh, and doing this with everyone. Uh, before we close this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and our God, we do thank you for the opportunities that we still have to uh, join together in worship, that even if we can't be together in person, that we can be united together in purpose and in worship to you. Father, pray that you would be with the doctors who are working on a vaccine, pray that they would have success and that uh, it might soon be made available, and that not only will we be able to go back to normal and be able to meet together once again, but that uh, we would be able to get rid of this virus for good and that we would be able uh, to, to live life normally and be able to serve you the way that we desire. Father, pray that you would be with each one as we go throughout this week. Pray that we would keep you at the center of our lives uh, and that in all things we might seek to please you even in a situation that, that is strange to us. Father, be with each one. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.